This video features Dr. Jim Thorne of the University of California at Davis. Dr. Thorne discusses methods to evaluate climate change impacts on rangelands using climate model projections. The video captures part of a workshop held in September 2015 titled, Coping with Historic Drought in California Rangelands, Developing Strategies, Tactics, and Tools. This effort is part of the USDA Building Blocks for Climate Smart Agriculture, funded by the USDA Climate Change Program Office and hosted by the USDA Southwest Climate Hub and California Subhub. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jim Thorne and uh, Pelayo Alvarez and Amber Kerr asked if I would come to give a presentation. So thank you very much for this opportunity. My colleague, uh, Dr. Heyoung Che is over here. We both work uh, here on the UC Davis campus in environmental science and policy. And we've been doing some work around uh, climate vulnerability assessments for different types of vegetation. So. Uh, while I, may, I don't have the context of this working group, you guys have a lot going on, I'm, I'll present to you what we've uh, recently completed, which is looking at grasslands and, and try and frame it within rangelands. So uh, thank you very much for that. And this work. So I thought what I'd do is I'd just kind of plow through, uh, first, a very short uh, review of climate modeling and what some of the projections for California are. Uh, and then uh, look at the sensitivity and adaptive capacity scoring, which is a way that we can start to formalize our ideas about what we think different species within, in this case, rangelands, how the, the different forage plants might be performing under changing conditions. Uh, and then explain a little bit about the climate exposure analysis that we've done uh, statewide for California uh, and give you a couple examples. And maybe a, the discussion would be best held to the end because I'll try and plow through a, a bit of stuff. But if you can't hold back, please uh, let me know. So whether climate can be uh, considered from the perspective of annual or monthly or daily. And uh, this talk is going to look at annual values. And we're going to su kind of summarize them over 30 years. So the drought right now, we're in a four-year drought. And that's sort of an extreme event, right? And a hurricane would be an extreme event. But climate change is the tide that's lifting all boats. And that our extreme events are fluctuating around that tide that's going up uh, at this point. So you know, we could look at minimum temperature in California. And this is summarized on uh, 5,000 watersheds, 5,100 watersheds for California. What's the annual nighttime low temperature? Or what's the annual precip? Or what's the annual daytime temperature? And then across the top, you can sort of ignore the bottom, but we can say, OK, we, once we've uh, figured out what index we want to use, we can look at that in terms of uh, historic time. So on the left-hand side, I'm digging in my pockets for a laser here. Um, you know. So here's the 60-year here's the trend on nighttime lows. And then here's some project, projections under a warm future and a hot future of what that same thing would be by the end of the century. And we can do the same thing for precipitation. So there's the average precipitation averaged over 30 years, the annual precip uh, in various different watersheds. And here's the historic trend over the last 60 and going out 100 years to the future what it might be under different projections. And there's a lot of different projections. So we have to then somehow bracket or say, what's the range of projections that we want to look at? And there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, this is a, a particularly intuitive way, perhaps, uh, to consider all the different GCM modeling groups that are out there and what they're saying is going to happen in California. So right here, I, I call this a Gonzalez chart because the first person I saw present one was Patrick Gonzalez. Uh, right here at the axis, that's California's current 30-year mean temperature and precip values. And every little dot that you see here is a different group of 100 nerds with a, a supercomputer that have their own ideas about how climate change is going to uh, change California. And the y-axis is how much is it going to change the precipitation. So by percentage, if it goes below this line, we're seeing drier conditions. And if it goes above, then we're seeing wetter conditions. So you can see there's kind of a spread. We uh, don't really know that much about what precip is really going to do. And then these uh, on the x-axis is how many degrees, in this case in centigrade, apologies, but uh, how many degrees warmer is it going to get by end century? And then notice that this is 
the uh, RCP 4.5. So this is a very hopeful scenario. Less, we're emitting a lot less than we are right now. Right now we're on a trend that's much worse than this. But that you can see that un under this case, you know, from one to two degrees. And if you hear in the news uh, nations trying to negotiate to keep us under a two degree warming. Well, this is what that might look like for California. Um, but this is uh, by the end of the century. Whoops. But, but this is really the track that we're on. So now note that we've gone up to an increase of four degrees here. Uh, and that's the RCP 8.5, the amount of emissions that are going into the atmosphere. So uh, really uh, a lot of the, net, the international negotiations and our concern should be about how much concentration of greenhouse gas do we uh, permit because of how much hotter it's going to get. The dots also let us see what the range of predictions are. And so these colored ones, this green one and the red one, are the ones that we've used to sort of bracket the conditions. And so we've bracketed uh, which, one, which future forecasts we're going to use so that we can, but we want to be explicit about that so that everybody can see these are the, the, these are the expected future conditions uh, that we're identifying, we're analyzing for, and that if we wind up with something that's way out here, well, that wasn't in the analyses. So here's the 4.5. We're using this green one and the red one. So it's uh, my rock down here and uh, CC, CCRM up here. And in the 4.5, they're, they're warming up to 2 degrees, 1.5 to 2 degrees, and in the 8.5 up to 4 degrees. And they represent about a 50% difference in precip between a drier and a wetter future. So we bracketed uh, drier and wetter and from 2 to 4 degrees warming uh, for the analyses that I'll, I'll show you here. Uh, so that was the first part. That was the climate change in two minutes review. I'm happy to talk more about that, but uh, uh, really we want to talk about how does that maybe impact or how, do, how will grasslands, rangelands interact with that. And one of the things that I've uh, recently completed, I've just finished a project for California Department of Fish and Wildlife that looked at the terrestrial vulnerability, uh, terrestrial vegetation vulnerability for all, vul for all types across the state. And as part of that, I developed a, a, a framework table. It's not the, I'm not the only one who's developed this kind of thing. There's many vulnerability assessments that use this type of approach. But it basically is saying, we want to uh, score for grasslands or for blue oak woodlands or for different habitat types, the various different species of plants that occur in there and, and think about how sensitive are they and what kind of adaptive capacity do they have? So uh, vulnerability assessments, those are important components. Sens and you can think of sensitivity as how sensitive is an individual to changes in climate. If it gets a lot hotter, uh, are they going to wilt and, and die because they can't handle it? That's sensitivity. And so I, I came up with a number of, of uh, scoring metrics so, uh, where they're every, on each column it's ranked from one to five. So for example, uh, most grasses have really good dispersal capacity. They generate a lot of seed, and that seed can get blown by the wind. It can get carried by animals. So it's not very sensitive. By contrast, uh, oaks have, are very sensitive when you think about dispersal because the acorn drops, and it doesn't go much further. Maybe a, wood, a woodpecker takes it 200 meters, but they almost never get carried long distances. So if oaks had to go from here up to Ukiah, it would be pro a big problem. They're sensitive. Uh, fire sensitivity, however, oaks have really good resistance to fire, generally speaking. Young trees, not so much, but the older trees uh, have thick bark. They don't burn too easily. So their sensitivity is low. And they also have a very good adaptive capacity, for example, that they can stump sprout. So the difference between sensitivity and adaptive capacity, adaptive ca capacity is do you have any tool that lets you kind of deal with, with things on the landscape? And so if you do, then you get a higher score. You get up to a five. If you don't, uh, then you get a lower score in that particular column. And what we, want, what we want to do to understand the overall sensitivity and adaptive capacity, the biological component of uh, our ability to adapt to climate change for a vegetation type is to get the, these means. So we, we look at their 
sensitivity to temperature and precip to fire, germination agents. So those would be, does, uh, if you have to have winter cold to germinate, or if you have to have uh, heat to germinate, then maybe you're more sensitive than a species that just germinates regardless of whatever happens. But if you are a facultative germinator, if you have a seed that lives in the seed bank for a long time, and then the, the one year in five that you get rain, it comes out in, uh, in, like gangbusters, well, then maybe uh, that's actually a very positive thing if we're going to see much more noise in, in how uh, uh, climate is progressing. So there, there's all these different characters. And I, I just wanted to point out that this is a way to be explicit about our hypotheses. So, for rangelands, you might have other categories that you really think should be in here to score species, and that would be fine. And you might look at it and go, Jim, reproductive lifespan, uh, you gave these grasses a very low score. I think it should be, I think they're not that sensitive. I think it should be a three or a four. Fine. Uh, but this is a way that we can start to be very explicit. And we've done this for about 120, 130 species in California now. So, Vulnerabilities have sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and exposure are typically the three pieces that are put together. And then the, we use those to create relative rankings of uh, the vulnerability of different vegetation types. I'm not going to spend much more time on this, but I wanted to point it out that there are methods that we can bring our existing knowledge into the climate change uh, framework uh, and, and start to use that, and I, I think that that's a valuable contribution. So how do we do the climate exposure, I hear you cry. Well, we started with the uh, 2015 vegetation map that uh, the state and UC Davis worked on to produce. It's the, the most recent FRAP map. So this is at 30 meters, and it's sort of the best of the, some people call it Franken-Veg, but uh, it's produced by CAL FIRE and available on the FRAP website. And it has sort of our, our, our current best map of vegetation. And we took this map and we looked at a new, a national classification called macro group. So you are, how many people know, are familiar with uh, California wildlife habitat relationship classes? Many people, okay. So, so this is like, like WHR, but a little bit more general. And it's in a national classification. It's about halfway up. So VegCamp and Todd Keeler-Wolf and the folks that are doing the detailed mapping, they're at the alliance and the association level. Go up a, a few more levels of generality, you hit macro group. And so what, uh, for the state, we did macro group. We're coming back and we're doing WHR. Uh, and, but we're using this as the base. And then we're using those two GCMs and the two emission scenarios I mentioned, the MIROC and C CRN uh, and the RCP 4.5 and the one that we're on, the 8.5, uh, as our analyses. So what we can, and why do we use a map? Well, we want to use the map because there's a lot of knowledge in a map that you don't necessarily get if you do species distribution models, which is very commonly what climate vulnerability assessments are using are SDMs. But an SDM would say, okay, let's take 500 points for, this is uh, uh, grasslands, the macro veg of grasslands for California. Let's take 500 points and we'll say which climate variables are best tied to those 500 points and we'll build a range map from that and then we'll project that into the future. Well, I can give you the climate conditions at every raster grid cell on this entire thing so you have several million points at which you're for which you're defining the climate envelope. It's, it's a much more complete sampling of the type. And so what, what do we do? Well, we take, uh, we have a hydrological model. I'm not going to spend much time talking about that basin characterization model. But we take about nine different climate variables that, and sample them in every grid cell for grassland or for blue oak woodland or for red fir or whatever habitat type you want. And then we, uh, we also sample the entire state. And, and here's what the climate of the entire state looks like. When you put it, when you take, a, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, about t 10 or 12 variables, and you put it into two. Oh, he, 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 Young's saying nine. Don't, you're overcounting, Jim. Uh, so this, this funny shape is, that's, that's the, a, ver, a vision of the climate of California in current time. And this is, so uh, it doesn't really show on this screen, but there's a white outer line, which is the same as this. And then these colored dots in here are the dots of grassland. So those are the climate conditions that we've mapped from every spot on this map and put into a climate envelope. 
And the stuff that's in blue, that's in the middle. Those are the, those are the places where those conditions, that's what grassland has 80% or 40% of the time. And the stuff that's in red out on the edge, those are the, the marginal stands. Those are the stands that are, from a climate perspective, are already kind of on the edge of being grassland as we define grassland uh, in this map. And there's, uh, there's only 5% of all the grid cells are there. And so you know, there's a little bit of them there and here. So what I've done is I've classified on the map the uh, most common, uh, every grassland is colored by how common is that climate occurrence uh, at that relative to all the grasslands in California. And then we're gonna, we're gonna, keep, we're gonna keep that classification, but we're gonna look at what happens to every site uh, going into the future. So this just illustrates how does that blob tie back to the map. So this is a veg type, a vegetation type here. And every dot here has an address on the map. And so that's the illustration of how we're going back and forth between the, uh, the PCA, the principal component analysis, and uh, the map view. So what do we do then? So we have our, we have our blob for grassland. And for any vegetation type, we're going to, we keep the contours that we've identified here, and we're going, we're going to see what happens to every grid cell relative to these st static contours. So as you go through time, whoop, the laser's going out. As you go through time, from current time to 30 years out, 60, 90 years out, you can see that the more and more of the locations are moving to conditions that right now we consider very marginal uh, conditions uh, for climate. So that's how we uh, are going to measure it. And then we will be able to put that back on a map. So what does that look like? OK, so in the report that is going to come out any day now from, from the state, uh, they're just finishing their edits on it, uh, we used macro group. But for this project, uh, for your group, we've rerun a few uh, of the, using the same FRAP map, using WHR types. So this is annual grasslands. It's ex almost exactly the same as, as the previous map that I showed you. Uh, and this is the current extent of them. And the greens now are the places where that climate is the one that's the most common. That's what grasslands experience the most frequently. And the red ones that are kind of around the edges, uh, those are in places that are uh, the least common climate conditions for grasslands in California uh, at this time. And we're gonna, we're gonna migrate that through time. So what, I've, what we've done here is we've created a block of four with lower emissions. This is RCP 4.5. Higher emissions, RCP 8.5. Warm and wet or hot and dry. That's that bracketing that I was talking about. And now uh, these blobs are showing us in the period from 10, uh, 2010 to 2039 uh, how many grid cells are migrating into the more marginal conditions, and, and where are they? So in the next 30 years, there's not a, a lot of increase in marginal, although we can see here and here and here, there is some red that's starting to show up. Let's go up to, let's go to the end century for AGS. So, now, I've skipped over the mid-century, mid but we've, we've got these 30-year pieces. So here we are out at 2100. And many times in climate change, we, we're, we want to have management strategies that are addressing the next 10, 20, 30 years. That's our typical planning horizon. But I think it's helpful to look at what the trajectory is, what we, what we think might be happening by end century, and then use that to inform management strategy uh, in the next 20 to 30 years. So if you just say, okay, here's what the conditions are going to be by 2030, and you you do all you spend all invest all of this effort trying to address that, and then by the time you get to 2050 or 2060, conditions are really very very different. Then some of that management effort has been lost or that uh, has been wasted because you weren't looking at what's coming down the road, figuratively speaking, uh, a little further. So by the end century, then. We can see that the uh, grasslands in the Sierra foothills, particularly under these higher emissions, are really uh, lighting up into getting into the worse and worse categories. Uh, and that the, but there appears to be some refugia or some places, uh, particularly in the central coast, that look like they continue to be in conditions that we uh, consider now to be relatively common. This is at the statewide view. We're flying at 50,000 feet here. 
And you could zoom in. Th these data are at 270 meter grid cell. So you could go in and you could look at a particular parcel and, or, or a particular uh, watershed or county and uh, start to see a lot more detail uh, than I'm showing here. But this is, this is a way for us to, to get a sense of, and, and this analysis, I should also mention, is intended to try to help managers on the ground. So if you say, I'm building a species distribution model and the species is here, we expect it to move to uh, Moscow, Idaho. Uh, well, that doesn't help anybody who's trying to manage something in the Sierra foothills here, right? That we want to know what is, how stressed are things going to be where, I, where we're working, uh, and, and that can inform our money decision, which is, are we going to try to ride with this and, and uh, accept that whatever change is coming, or, or are there places and things on this landscape where we can try to maintain the ecosystems that are there and maintain the, the functioning of, of rangelands as such? And so that's a, that's a big money decision relative to climate change. And this kind of analysis is intended to show, to be uh, spatially detailed enough that you could look at, uh, say, the, the Sacramento Valley and, and see, oh, there's places that look like they're refugia, and there's other places that look like they're going to be highly stressed. And so that gives us some guidance for decision making uh, using this approach. So, But it, it's a very similar thing for blue oak woodland. And one of the things that we're uh, working with Palayo and Mark Schwartz and Amber on is to say, what WHR types for rangelands would you want to combine? Because this analysis is quite sensitive to uh, what spatial configuration you throw in. So you could, we could throw a county into this and say, you know, what, is the, what does the future of this county look like? Or you could throw you know, whatever, whatever grid cells you include in your original map, that's the defining framework for the type. So uh, we're, I think, for example, blue oak woodland and blue oak pine, you want to combine those uh, rather than analyze them separately. We can, uh, however, uh, once you've done the analysis for all the different types, portray a map of the entire landscape of the entire state that brings back our analysis from all the types and puts them back, puts the pieces of the puzzle back together. So for blue oak, uh, similarly, if we just jump to the end of the century, we can see that our beloved back bathtub ring, you know, this is, this is really bad news. And, and you know, in the report, what I wound up doing was looking at what proportion of the range of each different type uh, moves into highly stressed conditions under the different GCMs and the different emission scenarios. And the message is, at, at the state level for all types, if we stay on the 8.5, two-thirds of California's native uh, natural lands are going to be highly stressed by the end of the century. So that is, that is re not even bringing in fire or land use or any other thing. Just the 8.5 takes us to a, a really extreme condition by the end of the century. So that's the thank you. Let me, let me show you this example. of uh, It's just an example of how you might use these data. So here's the rim fire. I think that's about 200,000 acre fire. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and what we've done here it, we, we had all the veg types, and this is a, an older analysis, so, uh, but it's still using a hot and dry and a warm and wet future. This one is the, the hot and dry future. And we, and we said, given what was there before the fire, it's all burned off, right? And now, the, now they've got 2,000, Forest Service has 2,000 management units that they want to uh, try to do something with in terms of restoration. Uh, given what was there before, what are the areas that if you planted the same thing, in, most case, in many cases ponderosa pine, there are big plantations up there, uh, that, that it would be highly stressed because of future climate. And so that's what the red is. That's early exposure for uh, those areas that if you went and you restored it to what was there before, you're uh, taking a bet that climate change isn't going to really impact uh, the establishment of those trees. And, and the green is the places that are the refugia, that by end century, what was there before, it's still going to be pretty good condition for that by end of century. So if you brought this in as some decision support in your restoration effort, it might, it might be one of the criteria that could be used among many others uh, in deciding what you would plant where. So that's the GFDL, that's the hot and dry, and here's the warm and wet. And so we, then we said, okay, well, let's roll those back together. So now here we have, where do you have agreement between a hot and dry future and a warm and wet future of 
uh, where the areas of stress and the refugia. So what, and so now this is almost trying to get at to the no regrets kind of idea that if you uh, if you plant in here what was there before doesn't matter if it gets wetter or drier is still going to be stressed but these other places might be uh, refugia sort of uh, regardless of which trajectory we really get onto and so that's a very hopeful message to me because it says that site mediates a good portion of the climate uh, impacts not all of them but it, it does mediate some of them so the soils and the topography uh, have a, a pretty good effect and so then you could zoom in, and so here's a, a map of the fire intensity kind of laid over our, our climate grids at, at 270. So this gives you a, starts to give you a sense of the functionality of, of this scale of analysis. And you know, so if I was uh, trying to plan different seed combinations, uh, seedling combinations, here's a high intensity fire in an area that's predict predicted to be refugia. It could potentially be what was there before. Here's a high intensity burn that uh, is an area that's expected to be stressed. Even if I just plant what I would traditionally have done before, if I recognize this difference, I could set up a little bit of monitoring uh, that would inform me in five years as to whether that was uh, a good idea or not. Or I could you know, adjust my plantings uh, accordingly. So th this is a restoration example from, I'm sorry, from a, a, a forest and woodland system but maybe there are similar types of considerations that you're looking at or, or uh, you know, rangeland management questions that would uh, somehow be transferable from this uh, example. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions.